welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the comments and the subscribers. I greatly appreciate it. Today, we're going to look at Philip Morris International, the international piece of the split between Philip Morris USA, which is Altria Group, which we've already reviewed, uh, and the international piece, which is Philip Morris International, trades under its own ticker, has its own management company. It's a completely separate business at this point. Behind me is the annual report uh, filed in December 2019. There'll be a new one coming out here shortly, but I wanted to go through the stock, take a look for it, uh, look at the historical returns, see how much cash flow it produces, and see what we can buy it at in the market. And if there's a difference between the two, what that economic return would be for us as value hunters as we buy this company. We're going to do, like we always do for stocks, we're going to look at this with five key attributes. We're going to look for top line revenue growth. We're going to look for EBITDA growth, strong free cash flow, low debt, and a well-priced stock as we cover all of these in this in this investment and figure out what we think it's worth. Then we look into the public market to see what the price is. And if there's a difference there, that is our economic return. All right, let's dive right into it. Revenue uh, for Philip Morris International. These numbers are net of excise taxes, by the way. You'll see if you look at the annual report, they show a gross number which is higher than these because I've already netted the taxes they have to pay uh, on their cigarette sales and, and tobacco product sales. So. Uh, millions USD, by the way, before we go through, just make sure you, you got that. 2011, $30 billion. 2019, $30 billion. Uh, it's really 31 and 20, yeah, 30. But uh, the point here is a negative 1% growth over time, which I was surprised by. If you remember, we looked at the, the, the domestic here in the U.S. So the U.S. piece, which is Altria Group, their growth rate of revenue was mid-single digit. Uh, here, international piece, it's falling by 1%. So I'm not exactly sure why I was surprised to see that. I kind of thought it would be the reverse. But a negative growth rate does not meet our very first hurdle that we look for on a, on a profitable investment. EBITDA seems to be falling in line, no pun intended, falling in line with revenue in that it's dropping. $14.444 billion to $11.828 billion dollars. That is an annual decline of 2.5%. Also not good. Let's look at enterprise value and see what the value of the business what is as a whole. Like we always do, we'll start with debt. Debt $17 billion to $31 billion. So uh, just shy of a doubling on debt. Market cap, market cap is shares outstanding times average price. I get total market cap $150 billion to $130 billion. Declining market cap, growing debt. These are going the wrong direction. Uh, enterprise value. Enterprise value is $167 billion, and it has declined to $160 billion. Kind of offsetting the decline in market cap with increase in debt. I'm guessing that they're using the debt to pay out dividends uh, and to try to prop up what is the declining share value. And you can see, well, we'll cover debt first. So we'll, we'll see debt does meet our hurdle in that it is below three times. It's 1.2, uh, now 2.7 uh, at, a, at a high water mark for, for the, for the his, history, but still definitely less than three. So it has less, it, ha, it can afford the debt it has. Enterprise value to EBITDA. So here we go. 11.6, kind of a high of 16.7. Uh, it's currently at 13 times which was a lot higher than the Altria group that we just looked at, um, seems to peak around 16 times what the same peak that Altria peaked at. So I think they do tend to fall in line, the two stocks in their, in their market multiple. But for some reason, there's a growing divergence between what um, Altria has on a market multiple and what Philip Morris International has. All right, let's take a look at cash flow for Philip Morris International and see if that falls in line with uh, see if that falls in line with EBITDA. Uh, ten point five billion dollars to ten billion dollars. Uh, that is a decline of one percent, which is exactly in line with what we're seeing in the revenue and EBITDA. So kind of a, a, a stagnant or stalled business. Capex Capex decreased in line just because they have less cash here, they have to spend less in here, but um, uh, but, it, but it's declining. I think the interesting thing to note here is the gap between this two, even though they are trending down, the cash flow is still strong because they make $10 billion. They only had to put back $1 billion. That's still $9 billion. 
debt payment was almost nothing, so it flowed through the equity holders. I would say that the cash flow here is strong, uh, but it's not, I would like it to be increasing, but it's, it's kind of flat and strong. So you've got um, free cash flow to equity. You've got shares outstanding, which are declining. Same thing we saw with Alternative Group there. They're using the free cash flow to buy and cancel shares, which is a good thing to do. It's judicious with the, with the equity capital. Free cash flow per share does seem strong and a decent single digit yield. Not as good as Altrio. I thought it was uh, Altrio's more underpriced, if I remember. But this is a mid single digit cash flow. Not, not what, I, what, what I would like to see for a company that isn't growing top line, though. We've looked at revenue, we've looked at cash flow. Let's go forecast and see what we think is going forward. Okay, so how do we forecast this business, right? We had negative, negative earnings growth rate. I'm gonna assume flat growth because I don't wanna bake in a turnaround. Um, I'm not confident they're gonna be able to do that given so many years of decline. I don't wanna bet on it. And I certainly don't wanna bet on it if it's trading at 13 times. I might bet on if it's five or six X, something really, really cheap. Um, but at a slight premium that I would consider to the market, I'm not gonna give them any kind of growth. So I'll hold the $11.8 billion of EBITDA over this time period. I will say that the EBITDA market multiple comes back down to something more appropriate for a company that is not growing, and then as a 10 times handle on that 2028 EBITDA. That gives me a $118 billion market, uh, excuse me, enterprise value, less some debt, just shy of $100 million of enterprise value, which divided by the shares outstanding gives me a $63 price target for 2029. Uh, All right, let's look at cash flow. Cash flow is the same thing, right? I'm picking up my historical $5.59 free cash flow that I have from my from last fiscal year. I'm levelized it throughout the entire period to give me a, a $68, excuse me, a $78 price target out in the future. Uh, again, with no positive growth rate on the free cash flow from operations, even though I think the cash flow itself is strong in terms of cash flow from operations, less capex. There's a, there's a wide margin there. It's not growing. So how can I pay a strong price for it? Let's take a look at where we think the stock could be in the future based on this pricing. So our price estimate, I average it, and I get a $70 price target. $70. We look out into the market and see what is it currently trading in after we've formed an opinion on what we would pay for a company that has good cash flow, but slow, but, but not growing revenue, not growing earnings. And it's currently trading in $80. That to me seems way out of line with the cash flow that we think it's going to generate. And there's certainly other deals out there that we would put our money in before we bet this one. If I put it into an IRR just to hit the point home, Cash flow, I'm in at 80, out at 70. Here's the net cash flows. That gives me a 7% annualized, annualized IRR over that period of time, which is not at all market and not appropriate for, for us as equity holders. So uh, I think this for us is gonna be a pass. I'm gonna give this actually a, a bad investment. Uh, I don't review too many bad stocks because who wants to watch a video and see a bad stock? But it is good to see what the alternative is. There's a number of characteristics here that I think you need to look out for. So let's go over our five key attributes. Top line revenue growth, no, it was declining. EBITDA growth, no, it was declining. Strong free cash flow, yes, I'll check the box. Low debt, yes, I'll check the box. Well priced, no, it's not. It's too expensive for a low growth company, uh, so we're going to pass. I think it's a bad investment. There are plenty of other growing companies with strong balance sheets and cash flow out in this market that you can find. So we're, we're past this point. I think it's a bad investment. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. This has been Philip Morris International. Thank you very much for watching the channel. I greatly appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button, comment, let me know what other stocks you want to see, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.